Monster Professor. Welcome to The Monster Professor, a show in which we discuss and explore monsters in literature, myth, film, games, folklore, culture, and beyond. I'm your host, Josh Woods, author, editor, professor, and monster expert. And today, we're going to talk about the Gothic. Those who play video games among my listeners might have noticed that that tasteless mix of music went from Bach to Castlevania. I'm going to talk about Castlevania absolutely on an episode about the Gothic. Uh, So here's what I mean by the Gothic, by the way. The types of stories in which the house itself is the monster or the castle as monster The place itself is the entity that is bringing the horror or the threat that in so many other stories, a separate sentient entity like a monster would. And so those stories, uh, they've been around for a long time, but they have a, a pretty particular tradition starting in the late 1700s. Uh, but, and moving all the way up through, well, not only recently, but even in places like video games like Castlevania. So I'll get back to the history about the Gothic in a minute. But let me talk about Castlevania, man. That that thing was so cool, or at least it was to me. It must be to others because they keep uh, reissuing new versions of Castlevania across just about every... Uh, gaming platform that there is that I can think of so starting with Nintendo um, the coolest but the coolest out of all of them for sure although it's my opinion but you know I'm also right about this is the PlayStation version of Castlevania called Castlevania Symphony of the Night man that was cool at the time the soundtrack for that thing was as cool as any video game soundtrack but more than that, I think, and it went for this like old school side scrolling, uh, kind of visual that even at that time had gone out of date. And so it was, even though it's a retro game now, it was retro when it was new. Uh, but the castle that you're trapped in, in that Castlevania game is so much more alive than in any of those other ones. So what I mean by that is in this video game, you're like the son of Dracula, Alucard. (laughs) That's Dracula's name spelled backwards. Uh, And you you make your way through this castle uh, fighting the evil entities in it or the evil entities that have possessed it or maybe the evil itself uh, that is the castle or Castlevania. And... You can make your way through, as hard as this game is, you make your way all the way through this labyrinth of a castle, uh, fighting every type of monster that there is. You fight a Frankenstein's creation, you fight werewolves, you fight creatures from Black Lagoons, you fight everything. And you can, it's difficult to do, but when you beat it, then the game's over, and then it does leave you with a little sense of dissatisfaction, like, wow, that was tough and interesting, but that was it. But if you did that, you didn't beat it in the right way. There's this bizarre, different way to beat it, in which once you do, then you're transported back into the same castle, but the entire castle is upside down. And so this is the true, or not the true, this is like the shadow of Castlevania, which is the second half of Castlevania, like the yang to its yin, or the right side of the brain to the left side of the brain. And so you find out, oh no, I'm only halfway through the game after and beating the entire game. And so you have to make your way up from the very tip top of the castle, which is now down in the depths, all the way up, uh, 
through this upside down castle. So you go through the upside down cathedral, you make your way through uh, at the very top of it, which would be like the upside down the uh, catacombs of hell and, and the underworld that is now the top world. It's so cool. And this, and it, the castle ends up having a, a certain type of personality. It was a huge influence on my book, the black palace, which you could say essentially is a Gothic novel. Um, so where did this Gothic novel thing come from? Most people recognize the first full real Gothic novel as being Horace Walpole's novel, The Castle of Otranto. And that was 1765. And this is the novel where you get so many of these kinds of images, or maybe even you, you might even say motifs or tropes that get associated with Gothic stories. You have this big, scary castle. You have a, a hapless maiden who is fleeing through the castle away from some evil villain or some monstrous threat. But she keeps finding ways away from the thing pursuing her because there are like secret passageways. But as she's traveling through halls, you have like pictures uh, or you have portraits in which the eyes are following her. You know, you've seen this kind of thing show up in all sorts of stories or TV shows, even cartoons will make fun of it, that kind of thing. Um, you have like books that pull down in the library and that's actually a lever to open a secret passageway. You have, uh, some, some hero kind of popping up at, at, and helping out the, the princess in her escape and then having to leave again. And you have, uh, you know, this old family and old money and this, this big castle with all these secrets, like that's all this novel. But when you get into reading this thing, man, it starts off a whole lot lot weirder than that kind of expected gothic i think well at least for me it starts off with okay so there's this the lord of this castle uh, has a son who's about to marry this maiden and the uh and the father is this evil gross dude who's like lusting over his soon-to-be daughter-in-law and at the wedding, as they're preparing for this thing, out of the clear blue sky falls this giant metal helmet, and it crushes the groom. <laughs> and it just, like a like an asteroid, just swoops down from the heavens and smashes him to pieces. Well, I, we don't know what he is under the thing, but he's dead, if nothing else. And what... And so what did, where did this giant helmet come from? I mean, it's gigantic. It's like the size of a small prison cell and he's dead. And then everybody's upset about it. And the princess or the princess to be is like grieving, of course. And she goes, locks herself up off in her room with her maidservants. And then uh, the, uh, the uh, evil old guy who owns the castle sees this and he's like, well, this is great. Now I can get her for myself now that my son is dead. And so then the pursuit begins, of course. <laughs> what? So what's up with this like helmet? Was it magic or did like, was, was it some like Greek god who's living in the clouds, like just his hat flew off one day and happened to kill that. Like what's going on with this? We never know. We don't know. And it's not like, Oh, it was actually just an illusion. Uh, it was, a an elaborate murder plot by this, by this Lord. No, it was just a giant, an inexplicable giant helmet falls from the sky and kills the dude. Um, but this this whole concept of like bizarre things falling out of the sky, like that shows up even in news stories until recent years. There are all there's whole chronicles of bizarre things falling out of the sky, not just rains of the rain of stones that fall onto people's houses as reported, but all sorts of bizarre animals living and dead falling out of the clear blue sky. Um, we'll have to do a whole episode just on weird things falling out of the sky. Uh, that's at least one fictional one in which it happened. 
But this term, like calling stories like that, in which uh, you, you, the whole thing's set in this large, threatening place, and this place almost has like this looming evil personality itself, or in some stories, it does have that personality itself. We call all that the Gothic, and where in the world is this coming from? Well, Horace Walpole did call his the castle of otranto subtitle a gothic story and it hadn't really been used in in relation to literature too much before that i mean just here and there i think the oed has like one or two records of it uh before horace walpole did it was mostly an architectural term but even there the thing is full of bizarre mystery um, Renaissance writers actually ter- uh, coined the term Gothic, and that was their attempt to try to distance themselves from the medieval era uh, that they were trying so hard to get away from. Now that you know the new discoveries and and uh, a new worship of kind of classical ideals came along, they wanted to reject anything that was you know deeply medieval and, and Christian in that way. Well, not anything. I guess doing their own versions of it is more accurate. Um, And so they would look at these great medieval cathedrals and they would see this kind of thing as a of a barbaric era that they were now improving. And so they just said, oh, you know, those barbaric goths made these kinds of things, even though they they even probably knew that was in no way historically accurate. But they started calling those medieval buildings gothic as kind of an insult. And then later when the romantics came along and were, you know, reacting against the Renaissance, Enlightenment era, or rationality, improving humanity all progress is good kind of thing the romantics reacting so hard against that you see as with i think uh, an, an ideal example is probably mary shelley's frankenstein that no maybe uh, new exploration and trying new ideas and science and stuff isn't always the greatest thing um and so the romantics are resurrecting this love of of things that are medieval and mysterious and so they started adding even more mystery and adoration to this term gothic uh, two architectural experts uh, named Trachtenberg and Hyman uh, say about the term. Uh, here's how they say it in their um, in their archaeology. Uh, their I mean, so their architectural textbook, uh, one of their one of the classic architectural textbooks. Uh, they say it was strange, and this whole Gothic architecture, by the way, and what's up with this messed up name? They say it was strange and different easier to copy than to understand. The term Gothic was kept despite its absurdity. No other architectural period carries such an incongruous title. Its mysteriousness, its primal energy seem to be captured by the term Gothic with its overtones of mysterious origins, fabled wanderings, wild imagination of the barbarian tribes of the North. Eventually, Gothic came a term, uh, came to be a term not that defined its architecture, but that was defined by the arch- architecture and whatever meanings were extracted from or read into it. Um, hence the gothic novel, crabbed and spooky, as that's what Trachtenberg and Hyman say in their in their chapter on gothic architecture. And so the the term itself is a mystery. Uh, in the simplest way, it's just wrong. In the grander and more expansive way, it's a whole mystery unto itself that needs to be explored, like a lot of these castles and haunted houses. I mean, the uh, haunted houses themselves are are gothics, right? I mean, they're um, this is October now. The the air is cooling. Although it's not October when I'm re- recording this, uh, I'm I'm hoping that it's going to be cool by the time this airs. And uh, you know, people are going to haunted houses. You could just go to like the monster experience, but instead, people want to go to the location that all their horrors are centered on, right? They want to go to the haunted house or the haunted mansion, haunted hospital 
the jail, the castle, the catacombs. It's the place that holds all the horrors. That's where we want to go travel, right? You don't want to go like go fight the werewolf experience. You buy your ticket just the same or encounter the ghouls experience. No, you want to know what is the place I'm going to that's haunted. And then once you're in that place, then you're going to encounter all the mysteries. And that's, I mean, that's gothic. Um, okay. So what kinds of what other kinds of gothic should we talk about? Um, Oh, let's talk about the classic or the Edgar Allan Poe classic, The Fall of the House of Usher. Like that's full on gothic. If you're going to, if you're going to classify as any, anything as gothic and this one, it's really short and it's, it seems straightforward at first, like a lot of Poe stuff. It seems when you read it, uh, like say if you're going to teach the thing, right? Teach, uh, you know, followed the house of Usher. What is there to dig out of it to talk about? And you're like, okay, well you have a, you have a guy who visits this like dying family in this decayed house. And the atmosphere is, is really well rendered with re- a lot of really cool details. And then it ends. So maybe there's a little bit of symbolism or something, but as with a lot of Edgar Allan Poe thing as stories, I think a lot of maybe literature teachers just kind of stop there. Like, well, did you get the atmosphere? Did you get what kinds of, you know, very obvious symbolism there might be? And then let's stop and move on. Right. But I think there's more to it. Okay. So in this story, you've got the visitor going to, um, going to comfort his old friend, uh, who's in deep despair, Roderick Usher. And he lives in this ancient familial man, uh, mansion, um, this, the, the Usher house. And this thing is like surrounded by a moat and it's remote. A lot of the great gothics, right, are isolated or when characters are in the gothic, they're cut off from the outside world, sometimes from regular time itself. And there's this like imperceptible crack reaching from the top of the house down to its foundations, maybe even deeper than its foundations. So how does the visitor even know it's there if it's imperceptible? He just feels like he knows it's there. If you could have seen it, then you would have seen it or something. It's it's done really well in the story. Um, And then... It turns out that Roderick Usher is so upset because he knows his sister is dying and that means the family line's going to die off with the only two remain remaining are himself and his sister and the sisters, you know, wandering the halls there, uh, uh, presumably going to die soon. And there's no kind of comfort the visitor can give. He's telling the story. And then she finally dies. Um, so visitor helps Roger Gusher bury her uh, in this tomb down in the basement or the catacombs of uh, Usher House. And then this big storm comes along and Roderick's freaking out because he's like, I've been hearing her for days. I, I know for sure we must have buried her too soon. We buried her alive. And then the in the midst of the big storm that's knocking open windows, there's this sister and she had crawled out of her tomb and she grabs onto Usher and the visitor freaks out and runs away. And as he does, the whole house just comes crumbling in on itself. There we go. Like, okay, the family died and the house died. So fall of the house of Usher is both, but, but it gets like, so what more is there to make of it? Well, Roderick Usher is, at his wit's end in despair about the death of his sister, but she's still alive. She's just wandering around there. And she seems like a ghost at first when you're reading this, like, wait, is she already dead? No, because she's just wandering like a ghost and won't talk to anybody. No, it's that he's despairing over the loss of something that he hasn't lost. And what is at the heart of anything that's decadent or a culture that's decadent or an institution or a family like the house of Usher, which is both an institution and a family in this story, what is more decadent than 
lamenting the loss of that very thing, even though it's not lost yet, it's still alive. You can still have all sorts of uh, living interactions with it. It can still propagate and continue. Um, but he's already done with the thing. He just wants to wallow in this despair that it's lost, that she's lost, that the family's lost. And then as soon as she shows signs of unresponsiveness, like who wouldn't if somebody's, um, you know, mourning you for being dead and you're not even dead. And so she's unresponsive and to push it even further, he goes ahead and buries her certain that she's dead. And so the height of decadence would be going ahead and killing off the thing that you are lamenting or despairing that is over and and you nail it down in its coffin. So it's not like the thing fell apart and you're just sad about it. You're the thing bearing the thing because you think it's dead. Uh, but you are the one who killed it. And he, and he buried her alive. And then he knows that she's down there and he could have resurrected her. But he didn't because he was just too full of despair over the whole thing. And what's the point? Um... I, I would say, like, what kind of lessons might, you know, how could that lesson be applied to other things? I don't know. I see, I see people lamenting, you know, the, the death of the modern academy or the modern university. I've been guilty of doing that kind of thing. Uh, but it's, but are we Roderick Usher? Like, it's not dead yet. Should we just like cry in despair and bury it before it's dead? I see people doing that with like their own country or all sorts of things or news media. I don't know. Like, yeah, it's decadent and things are not good. Maybe we're all in the house of Usher. Um, and, but maybe the problem is that we're acting like Roderick Usher. I don't know. Maybe not. Could be wrong about many things. Often am. Uh, what else should we talk about? We gotta talk. Whoa, we've gotta talk about Shirley Jackson. My God, she's amazing. Um, her probably her most famous book is a, very much a gothic, The Haunting of Hill House. Oh, that's a really cool book. You got this like meek young lady named Eleanor who's kind of just been. A victim of the world. Uh, she's kind of down on herself and kind of treats herself awfully and lets herself get bullied by everybody. And she has this opportunity to go off to this horribly haunted house and live there for a while because you have some paranormal investigator wanting to gather people here and find out what's up with this house. She's a nobody. She's not any sort of expert at anything except that when she was younger, there was a rain of stones on her house. And once again, you have this, this uh, idea of random creepy things falling out of the sky. Uh, that's the same thing that uh, Stephen King's Carrie uh, first encountered. That's the first kind of paranormal, supernatural thing that, that she manifested, by the way. It was a rain of stones. Stephen King was hugely influenced by Shirley Jackson's uh, Haunting of Hill House. In fact, in response to that, he wrote The Shining, which is another shining example of the Gothic. Uh, you have the place itself being the horror that pulls up the very worst out of its characters. Uh, and so in both uh, Haunting of Hill House and The Shining, you have characters who are under constant threat in this house, uh, in the place, the mansion, the hotel, the castle, whatever it is. And there's no getting away from it. They're isolated by weather or by the town or by the mountain itself. They're trapped in here with these other characters. And one by one, people are like falling apart, losing their sanity, dying. But the house itself is reflecting uh, that malice in the characters' hearts, or maybe the house is the reflection of the messed up characters. The really good gothic always keeps that kind of vague as long as it feels like the place itself is alive in its own way. But the, the gothic that Shirley Jackson wrote that is even more amazing than The Haunting of Hill House, as amazing as that one is, 
is one that she wrote very late in her life called We Have Always Lived in the Castle. Now, how's that for a title? We Have Always Lived in the Castle. That's cool. And the, and the book lives up to every bit of promise that that title offers. This thing has this, once again, this family in this decadent, decayed house, this big, amazing mansion-like house. And the whole family has died in this mysterious dinner one night. And it takes a while to start picking up on the idea that actually the whole family was poisoned by one of the family members and the only two or the only survivors of the family are these two young girls um mary cat and uh uh, constance and then uh, their uncle julian who is left kind of paralyzed and and half insane uh in a wheel well like not paralyzed he's in a wheelchair and he's not all there and he keeps trying to figure out what happened that night with going through his notes and they have a lot of money and wealth um and so there's like this mysterious hidden treasure that uh that is associated with the gothic all um and so many cool stories and and the town around this house hates them with every every heart in that town hates them to its maximum capacity. Um, they think these girls are, although not literal witches, they might as well be as evil as literal witches. The whole uh, family, the last name Blackwood, by the way, which I think Shirley Jackson must have got from Algernon Blackwood, this amazing weird fiction writer, uh, big influence on H.P. Lovecraft, by the way, um, wrote this amazing story uh, called The Willows, which will just blow you away if you want to find stories that have this atmosphere that is so uncanny and unnerving. And he also wrote The Wendigo, which is really cool. I'm getting off track. Those aren't gothics. Well, kind of The Willows is, though, because it's the place itself that's the true horror, and they're isolated in this canoe trip. Uh, in, in Europe, they're going through this canoe trip that takes them through this, this place of willows that in which these branches are hanging down, like, like fingers constantly trying to grab at them. And the storm is coming through and they know the place hates them and the place doesn't want them to be there and there's no getting out of it. And so you still have the place and the isolation and the attack uh, so I guess that one is a gothic, really. It's just not within walls itself. And wait, where was I? Talking about we have always lived in the castle. Oh, man, I don't know. Maybe I shouldn't ruin too much of it for you. Just that place is amazing. That story is amazing. And it will just blow you away. If you want to get blown away by Shirley Jackson, dig into that book. We have always lived in the castle. Algernon on Blackwood, The Willows. Oh, H.P. Lovecraft's The Rats in the Walls. Man, that's full-on gothic, right? And another big influence on Stephen King. But, you know, H.P. Lovecraft, of course, was influenced by these people who came before him. Um, you know, Walpole's, Horace Walpole's uh, Castle of Otranto, of course. Another uh, uh, late 18th century writer, uh, Anne Radcliffe, was uh, so much influenced by Castle of Otranto that she did her own version of that kind of story, The Mysteries of Old Dolfo, uh, which, you know, you can already hear how it sounds like the exact same title. Uh, she did her own twist on it, but she she really got the difference, uh, as she called it, between uh, horror and terror. Uh, if I'm if I recall correctly, I don't have it in front of me. Um, but she said something to the effect of, you know, I, I would, I would pick different terms than she did necessarily to differentiate these. Um, but, but these are her terms anyway. So here's how she picked it. Um, horror is walking into the room and finding the, the gruesome mutilated or the gruesome murdered body of someone like, Oh no, that's horrible. That's bad. That's horror. She says, terror is different. Terror is walking into a pitch black room and stumbling over something and thinking 
that you're pretty sure that's a murdered body, but you can't see it. Now that's terror. That, uh, that's Anne Radcliffe, uh, late 1700s, uh, writing stuff in this Gothic world. And so, man, she gets it. She got it early on. It seems like people keep trying to figure out how to rediscover that fundamental concept of good horror writing is that showing the terror or looking at something awful. That's just gruesomeness, right? That's not, that's not real fear. That's not true horror, uh, to mess with her terms a little bit, right? If you watch these movies that are termed horror movies and what they do is show you that like bad things can happen to your body, you could, this part can be chopped up, that part can be smashed, this part can be mangled in this way, and, and all and like horrible things can happen and you can die. Okay, we get that, we all get that. Um, that's not the same. That's not anywhere close to the same as true fear, true terror, true horror, and especially not the same as cosmic horror. Oh, cosmic horror. Speaking of, one of the greatest gothics on film ever is the 1978 film Alien. That's the famous, surely everyone knows that one, Ridley Scott, you know, Sigourney Weaver. I mean, what you have in that film is this gothic castle in space, and that's the only real difference between the gothics that came before it. I mean, you, the Nostromo, the name of the ship, uh, which is the the title uh, and title character of uh, uh, a Joseph Conrad uh, story. Joseph Conrad, probably more famously known as the author of Heart of Darkness, right? Nostromo is this as the name uh, given again to the ship in this movie. And you look at that thing, and it looks fundamentally like a gothic castle. I mean, it's built like, or a cathedral, it's built like a gothic cathedral or gothic castle, right? And you, so you have this gothic floating in space and they land on this planet in which, uh, they go out and check this distress signal. They gear up in these big, like, uh, medieval knight suits of armor that just happen to be called space suits, right? So they look, they're these space suits, uh, medieval pieces of armor, and they go into the depths of this hellish, uh, long forgotten decadent gothic castle one that's even uh, a bigger threat than their own because it looks like the inside of a whale or something like the overwhelming walls are like ribs they're in this living place and they contract an alien and they bring it back on the ship because of betrayal by one of their own who isn't truly human. And that's at the heart of the uncanny is something that seems human, but isn't truly human. I mean, at least according to Sigmund Freud and in his excellent essay um, on the, uh, on the uncanny, one of the features of the uncanny for him is anything that is, that seems human, seems like one of us, but turns out not to be, or something that you think is not alive, but turns out to be. And so anytime that line is dissolved or that role is flipped, we have this sudden unnerving fear that we can't quite pinpoint. And that's the fear of, that's the feeling of the uncanny. Uh, he also points out that, you know, the German word for uncanny, unheimlich, uh, is the name that they give to haunted houses. Unheimlich houses uh, would be something closer, uh, translated more literally to uncanny houses. But we tend to call ours haunted houses, just so that we know we're trying to preserve the atmosphere of the thing. Oh, where was I? Oh, oh, alien. Yeah, and so in alien, uh, you have... Once again, in the you're trapped in space. Talk about isolating the protagonist. You're trapped in space, and you have the monster, you have the threat chasing you uh, through this place. But it's not just like chasing any old buddy. Once again, like deep in the tradition of the Gothic, the the attacker is chasing the maiden through uh, this labyrinthine type of Gothic castle. 
And she has to keep fighting him off and fighting him off and fleeing for her life until she can, you know, exercise this demon, right? In this case, she jettisons him out into space, but you, you blast this, uh, you, you get this, the monster out of the house and you escape for your life. In that film, you also have this, this aspect of the Gothic in which time here seems to be not the same as it is elsewhere. And so time itself has stopped because, I mean, they're so far out in space that they have to like be in uh, this kind of stasis to get them through these long lapses of time. You know, other planets, days and months and years are going by, which for them, it's just uh, uh, um, one long sleep from one place to another. And she ends by putting herself back in this deep sleep uh, to be lost in time once again. It's so cool, and it's and it's everything that a gothic is. I said I I said my own book, The Black Palace, um, was a gothic essentially, uh, influenced by a lot of things. One one of the influences was this excellent film by Alex Garland, uh, who is a, who is just a genius writer and filmmaker. Like you can just read his scripts, like his script for Ex Machina, uh, his script for Dread. Like these are they're perfect scripts. The films he directs of these scripts he's written, they're perfect. They're amazing. It's so cool. Um, And so, and he did this action uh, film called Dread about this uh, British indie comic called Judge Dread. They made some 90s movie with Sylvester Stallone. You know, I'm not saying watch that one. I'm saying watch the Alex Garland one in what, 2009-ish or something? It was something around there. 2012 I don't remember and you have this law enforcement officer go into this really dangerous building that's run by this bizarre mafia and then he gets trapped inside the blast walls go down and there's no getting out and he's the only one of his kind and you have all these attackers from every angle that was a that was a take off of this um uh this um a movie from what is it the Philippines called Ray the Raid or sometimes called the Raid the Redemption or something you don't need you don't even need that subtitle same kind of thing which uh, you have like these law enforcement officers raiding this building but getting trapped inside and now they're on the the criminals turf right and they have to flee for their lives or fight back uh, you see that same kind of thing in like Die Hard. Those are, you know, more action oriented than atmosphere, uh, more crime and action than, than monster and fear. Um, but you have kind of the setup of a Gothic. Why doesn't it feel all the way like a Gothic then? Like an, like alien, you might go, that's science fiction, but it sure feels like a Gothic. Well, a big part of it, I think, is the the place itself, and in those, in like Die Hard and Dread, they're kind of gothic space. You don't feel like the place itself is alive and after you. But by the time the alien is growing and chasing people, it seems like the Nostromo itself is more a part of the alien, and the alien is more a part of the Nostromo the ship than than the ship is one of their own. I mean, there are so many scenes in which they're, they walk right by the monster, walk right by the alien. Um, and the only reason they don't see him is because he just blends in too well with the architecture of their own ship. Like he is an extension of this place now, or he has become one with it. And so you really get this sense that the place itself is the monster that's at the heart of the Gothic and uh, Gothic. And that's when you're really deep into it. Oh man, there's so many things we didn't, that we didn't talk about. God, we didn't even bring up that talking about the Southern Gothic and in that tradition and in literature, oh, we should, and oh my God, there's so many other cool ones. And, uh, and, uh, 
I feel like I've just been all over the place. Maybe I should have a more structured show than this. Like I, I start with a list. There's how the show goes. I like make a list of some things that come to mind uh, in a very sloppy way on half a sheet of paper. And I hit the microphone button and to, to record. And then we just start recording. And this one in particular, I felt like I, I went all over the place. I don't know. Let me know. Give me some feedback. Should I get more structured? Maybe like I did the first few episodes. Should I just keep rambling about cool things? I guess it doesn't matter if we talk about, as long as we're talking about cool things. Either way, you can contact me on my website, joshwoodsauthor.com. And also, if you like the show, don't forget to give me ratings on whichever platform you listen to me on, uh, iTunes, uh, Stitcher, you name it. I hope you found this uh, discussion of the gothic really cool, and I hope it's helping you amp up for Halloween, because this is the best time of the year. That's just a fact from the Monster Professor. That's a rock fact, by the way, which is a reference to something I'm going to talk about in a future episode about Halloween things that I love. But for next week, what monster are we going to talk about? You're going to have to wait and see. It's been good talking to you. I hope you enjoyed this edition of The Monster Professor. Monster Professor.